Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, flying solo. So Steph Curry is now officially the greatest three-point shooter in NBA history. We all know that was already true before, but he officially passed, finally, he passed Ray Allen for number one on the career all-time list. The Warriors beat the Knicks 105-96, and Steph was one behind Ray, and then he hit that, and then later in the first quarter, he hit the second one, and that was a very cool moment, you know? And I've been saying that I wanted to see him get the record in New York at Madison Square Garden just because of the magnitude of that space, the basketball mecca. The fans, they're always so into it. They want to see a show. They seem to be pretty pretty smart about basketball, you know? And all the history of Steph, for those of you who don't know, when he was picked in 2009, the Knicks, they were going to pick him. And Steph wanted to go there. Dell said that he wanted Steph to go there. Because that would have been, I mean, everybody wants to play at MSG. And the Warriors took Steph, of course. And then the Knicks ended up with Jordan Hill, who was a journeyman, mediocre to bad big man. And then, of course, Steph had that 54-point game, which was really kind of his coming out party to the rest of the league. Everybody knew who he was and knew how good of a player, how good of a shooter. But that's what really shot him into the upper stratosphere of, wow, this kid is going to be a star level player. So it was cool, you know, just all the people that came and paid top dollar to watch this game in New York and to have Reggie Miller calling the game for TNT and then Ray Allen showing up. It was nice, you know, it was nice. And I got to admit, once he hit that three, I probably replayed that for about 15 minutes, just kept going back and seeing all the different angles. And like I've said before, I like seeing replays and watching the crowd reactions, the other player reactions, like what did Draymond do when Steph hit that shot? What did Wiggins do? And by the way, uh, as a footnote, a piece of trivia, Steph hit that shot over former teammate Alec Burks, and he got the pass from Andrew Wiggins. So Andrew Wiggins got the assist on that. Remember that for next time you have some weird sports trivia night. But I'm so glad that he finally got this record out of the way. I talked about this with Vubang, and you know it seemed like Steph was pressing, and there was so much pressure to get this record. Even if they say it wasn't really a distraction, it was a distraction. It can't not be, especially if this whole like anticipation of breaking the record lasts a whole week, pretty much, right? It started off with the Portland game and then went to the Philly game and then to the Pacers game and then to the Knicks game. And, you know, Steph didn't even shoot that great tonight after he hit that shot. He shot five or 14 from three, which, you know... (laughs) Yeah, he's had a rough week from three. Hopefully getting all this behind him, it'll start clicking and coming back. But I got to say, man, like, I don't know if this record will ever be broken. Now, we all know that records are made to be broken and there's never a record that someone is never going to be able to get. But man... Just the combination of how Steph plays and what he does, you've never seen anything like it. And it's going to be hard to have another person like that, right? We we thought we would never see another Michael Jordan, but Kobe Bryant was as close of a facsimile as you will ever see. But that's different, right? Kobe was blessed with being 6'6 and super athletic, and he had that drive. But Steph... He has a very, very unique skill set that has little to do with his physicality, with his athleticism. It's the hand-eye coordination that Andre Iguodala always talks about. It's the work ethic. It's the ability to shoot off the bounce, running around, coming off screens, and also just like catch and shoot. Not everyone can do that, you know? Like, sure, somebody can dribble a ball and shoot it. Like, Clay can do that. But consistently off the bounce the way Steph does, no. But Steph can do what Clay does, right? Running off screens or just camping out on the wing and hitting an open catch and shoot three. 
so there's a rare combination of what Steph can do and also the longevity. Yes, he had some time early in his career where he was out with uh, ankle injuries and then he missed that season a couple years ago with a broken hand. But for the most part, he has been there being that guy. And that's another part of it too. He's had the green light for a long time and he's played with some amazing players, some Hall of Fame players, all-star players, and he's been on one of the greatest teams in NBA history, largely because of him. He's the engine that makes it go. So maybe somebody could do it for a couple of years and reach a certain clip, but can they do it for this long? And we all know that Steph broke Ray Allen's record like in way fewer games than Ray Allen played what is like 500 fewer and Steph's just going to keep going. He can go as long as he wants because he can end up just being a spot up shooter when he's 40 years old. He could pull a Tom Brady pretty much and play as long as he feels like it. I don't know. Somebody could, somebody will. I don't think there's anyone in the NBA right now who can do it. All the other dudes who are around Steph's age obviously are not going to catch him. I don't think James Harden doesn't have a shot in terms of young guys. What? Trey Young, I don't think he's going to do it. I don't think Trey Young will last as long as Steph, and he's not as good of a shooter. He'll have to be a greater shooter. Or, as I was watching the TNT guys, during one of their segments, they were talking about if teams start jacking up 53s a game, then maybe. Yeah, sure, if you increase the number of attempts by a ton, just like the attempts have increased a ton for Steph from Reggie Miller's day and Ray Allen's day, then maybe. But who knows? Who knows? I think it'll be tough just because, like, look how fast Steph has done it, you know? It'll have to be a point guard. It'll have to be somebody who has the ball in his hands nonstop. And it'll have to be somebody that has a decent team around him so that teams just don't crowd him all the time or double him or limit him. So, you know, people have said that we've seen guys like Steph before, like Mahmoud abdul Rauf. We've seen these dudes in college who are great, but then in the NBA, they just become spot up shooters, role players, whatever. And yes, the rules have changed to some extent to allow Steph to do what he does. But still, I don't know if any of those guys pull off what Steph has done at this point. So it's very cool. Like it's interesting though, too, because Reggie on the broadcast was saying how back in his time when he broke the record, it wasn't that big of a deal. But the way that Steph has changed the game and made the three-pointer one of the most exciting, critical shots in the NBA, that's a thing. Back then, it was way different. So it's celebrated now and also because of who Steph is. You know, he is this Hall of Fame to be player, two-time MVP, transformative figure, one of the most exciting, electrifying players to have ever played in the NBA. And I'll be honest, man, I am just always thankful that we get to watch him play and not just in the NBA, but for our team, for our favorite team, the Golden State Warriors, a team that was God awful for decades. And he came and this unassuming kid, he rescued it, you know? So I'm very thankful for that. And I'm very glad that he has many years ahead of him being a showman, being the center of a three ring circus, a good three ring circus. And I look forward to everything that he continues to do afterwards. It's going to be a, it's a, it's going to be a hell of a ride. This isn't something where it's like an end of a career. He's been chasing this and all of a sudden it's like the capping off his, his legacy. He's still in his prime. You know, I talked about how maybe he's lost a slight step. That doesn't matter. Jordan lost a slight step in his early thirties. You know, which is why he started doing all the fadeaway shots. One thing that I noted from also the broadcast was that I guess Reggie Miller broke the record playing the Bulls, Steve Kerr's Bulls. And then Ray Allen broke the record when Reggie was doing the TNT broadcast with Steve Kerr and I think Marv Albert. And then tonight, Reggie Miller was... And in this game, Reggie Miller was doing the broadcast and Steve Kerr was obviously coaching the Warriors. I don't know. I think that's random. I think that's weird. Uh, and I think that's really kind of cool. So, you know, they're the common thread amongst all these record-breaking moments. 
football fans. I'm sure we all love an action-packed, high-scoring NFL game, but with the latest no-brainer from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, you'll be a winner once a single point scored. New customers who bet just $1 on any team to score can win $100 in free bets. It's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still get in on the NFL action. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contests. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, use promo code TBPN, bet $1 on any team to score, and win $100 in free bets. If they score, you score with promo code TBPN this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required. One per customer. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Get into the game. Hey, you know, I could easily say that the Warriors played sloppy and they played subpar compared to what we've seen. And, you know, this trend that I've noted of how they haven't played their best basketball in the last couple of weeks. I'll give them a little bit of a pass because of their airplane trouble. For those you don't know, they were supposed to leave Indiana after the Pacers game, but they had plane trouble. So they stayed overnight. And then the morning of the next game, they had some more plane trouble and got to New York later than ideal. Most NBA teams, I think it might be a rule, they don't travel on game days. So that's why they leave right after games. That can lead to fatigue, injury, also lower level of play, and it screws with competition. You know what I mean? But luckily, the Knicks aren't very good. A couple of good things that I saw from the Warriors was Andrew Wiggins, aggressive again, 18 points, three of six from three, six for 13 overall. Still not shooting that great from the free throw line, but he had six boards and three assists. One of those being, of course, like I mentioned, the assist on Steph's record-breaking shot. Jordan Poole, he did not shoot well at all, but he still had 19 points. He was 3 for 11 from the field, 0 for 6 from 3, but 13 of 13 from the free throw line. Hallelujah. You know, if you listen to this podcast, I always talk about how the Warriors need somebody to get to the free throw line and get the other team in foul trouble and just add another dimension. And Poole did that tonight. I mean, he's not an Allen Iverson get to the bucket and get fouled type guy. But, you know, I've hoped that he would be that guy who could just attack and if not make the shot, get to the line, get fouled get a couple freebies, and he also can hit his freebies, you know? The guy shoots about 90% from the charity stripe. It was a very, very James Harden-esque line, if you will, like James Harden light, maybe old school James Harden before they changed the rules, but shooting a bad percentage, but getting to the line a bunch. Poole also had nine boards and three assists. You know, not bad, not bad at all. Jonathan Kaminga, he got minutes just like we had all hoped. And we figured he would, right? Because of the road trip and a couple of tough back-to-backs and all the travel and everything. And tonight they sat Otto Porter Jr. But based on what Steve Kerr has been saying, he was going to play Kaminga some legit minutes anyway. And man, that kid is going to have to be in the rotation eventually. He just does so much, especially on the road. The kid is not phased. He didn't play a perfect game, made some defensive mistakes, especially on that lob to Mitchell Robinson to end the third quarter. But Kaminga was two for two, plus seven, a couple boards. But his defense, his defense is always, always impressive. Next time you watch a game, if you don't already do this, when Kaminga is in, watch him play defense. Don't watch the ball. For a couple possessions, just watch him. Because I've said this before, he can guard one through five. Maybe not for a whole game. But for his minutes on a very switchy defense, he can totally do that. He cut off quickly a few times on the Knicks, and he played Julius Randle really, really well. And Randle is big. You know, he's big and he is wide. And he is in his career prime, so he's strong. And just like the Pacers game, where you saw Kaminga play Sabonis and force Sabonis to pass out of possessions in the post, 
You saw Randall do the same thing, or you saw Randall miss. So those are the little things. Most rookies are not very good at defense unless that's their specialty. Kaminga's specialty wasn't technically defense coming in. It was his highlight plays, his potential athletically. But in a short time, in just a couple of months, he's become very, very solid. I mean, I don't know how good he was in the G League for the Ignite playing defense, but I don't think he showed as much discipline. So that's a positive that he's continuing to take the coaching and the development and all that good stuff. Some of the guys I've mentioned since this road trip started, like Damian Lee, Juan Toscano Anderson, those guys who are career journeyman role players, they didn't have the greatest games, but you know when they get home, they're more solid. But Jonathan Kaminga, that kid's a star. You know, that kid is going to be amazing. And and so, like, he is a guy who could be on the floor, on the road, and play the same as he does when he's at home consistently, right? I'm not saying that when JTA and D. Lee get on the court on the road that they just fall apart. But they haven't had the best, most consistent moments so far on this road trip. D. Lee was having a really bad game defensively and offensively until he hit a big three-point shot in crunch time. You could tell that he was relieved, as were most of the Warriors fans that I saw on Twitter. Anyway, it was a fun game to watch. And again, that was an excellent moment. Steph breaking the record and everything. It was cool to see just the random people that show up at Knicks games, right? Like, obviously, Spike Lee and then Chris Rock. I don't know who the heck else, but, you know, it creates definitely like a vibe. And you could sense it a little bit watching at home, even. It was cool to see Steph's parents there. Dell and Sonia and Steph passing Dell the ball when they hugged it out after he broke the record. Man, he grew up idolizing his pops, you know? Like that was his hero. Your dad is an NBA player. He better be your hero if you're trying to get to the NBA. And I'm sure that was an awesome moment for him. It does make me sad though that, you know, with all the personal stuff with Sonia and Dell splitting up to see them sitting separately, I was kind of like, ah, oh, that's a bummer. And every time the broadcast showed it, I was like, yeah, let's let's just make this more obvious, huh? Leave them on the screen so people at home can say, hey, why are they not sitting together? Anyway, fun night, fun game, sloppy as hell, but the Warriors got the W. There were a lot of frustrating moments, but for now, those are all forgotten because, hey, it's a win in a game where some cool stuff happened and the Warriors had to be tired, you know? They had to be like off their game a little bit. Oh, I also got to talk about the moment after Steph broke the record where he was hugging Draymond and he was talking to Draymond about stuff. And I instantly flashed back. I don't know about you, but I flashed back to that 54-point game where Steph hit a three and the crowd was going wild at Madison Square Garden and he was doing his shimmy and Draymond put his hand up to give him a high five and Steph shimmied right past him. You know, that was, I believe, Draymond's rookie year. And it was hilarious then. It's hilarious now. But it's crazy to think how far those guys have come, right? How far their relationship off the court, on the court, how far Draymond has come and how much has happened to them and to this Warriors team, the Warriors core, since that moment up until now. Time flies, man. That's crazy. I mean, it's crazy that Draymond's got gray in his beard. But hey, the Warriors play the Celtics in Boston on Friday, and then a quick turnaround again, another back-to-back in Toronto against the Raptors. Both those teams, the records don't honestly reflect how good they are, how much talent they have, because obviously the Celtics have Jason Tatum, but I believe they just got Jalen Brown back. So again, people are going to be up for the Warriors, so they're going to be coming at them very, very hard. And then the Raptors, They had a rough go of it, but they're hitting their stride. And also they got Pascal Siakam back, who's playing better, getting back into game shape and everything. So they're always dangerous because they have some really, really solid pieces. And Nick Nurse is a good coach. So again, hopefully we'll take both of those games, but I'll be I'll be all right if it's one. If the Warriors split those and they go back to the Bay three and two. Solid. You know what I mean? Solid. Anyway, that's another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Patrick E. Pino, E-P-I-N-O. 
or at Oakland Warriors, check us out at OaklandWarriors.com and be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in and listen. The Oakland Warriors podcast is produced by National Film Society and is a part of the Basketball Podcast Network. And if you can, would love it if you could leave the show a five-star rating and or a nice review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you and good night. That's it. Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time and go Dubs. Go Dubs.